We figured we'd just do the last one. Give them this one. This is the last one. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Maker's Fair 2014. My name is George Hattenheim, and I'm talking tonight about the ability to make and making the ability to make, and over time, how you can um, in, increase your practices to where you get to where you want to go in an ability to make. But um, before we get started, what do we make? Why do we make? We all do different things. Um, I was a big Rocky and Bullwinkle fan as a kid. And every time, even though you knew something was going to come out of that hat and you were anticipating that it was going to be something unusual and different, it got you by surprise every time. And it built an imagination for me. And so I thought a little bit about what would I want to do to start out talking to everybody at this place that has such wonderful imaginary concepts and pieces coming to life. And I thought, that's an old trick that everybody does, right? Pulling a rabbit out of a hat. We never find out, how do you get the rabbit into the hat for the magician to pull it out later, right? I'm a maker. I can handle this. I can figure out a way to get a rabbit into a hat so the magician can get it back out later, right? I've got one fancy magic button. Let's take the other one. Okay, guys, ready? And you're going to go three, two, one. Thank you. Okay. So just why do we make things? I don't know. Sometimes we have a crazy idea of something we want to do. Okay. Um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and why we're here. Um, we've got some pictures. Um, I recently it, am in studio number eight. I wanted to start a little bit at my design education, and I was at ASU in the desert, and while I was supposed to be designing fancy things, I would often go out into the desert and find old electronic bits that had been weathered by the elements, and I went back into the studio and I had to battle with, we were supposed to be making shiny things, but at the same time we were already filling up the desert with things that could do stuff. I, I knew it from my youth. And um, I did a lot of photography and was really battling with what is it that we make, you know, where are we infringing on nature, where are we leaving it, and so I really turned away from so many of my peers that made shiny objects that were going to be produced over and over again, and I decided I wanted to know how to make the things that I could think of. You know, everybody has these wonderful ideas, but how could I make them? So a lot of people spend time um, learning different things. I started using all my spare time to acquire studio skills, to learn how to make things. And unfortunately, and this is part of why we're here, hopefully, is to avoid for some of you, you will acquire things that will limit your capability over time, but they will also allow you capability over time. I remember getting my first large gas cylinders, and you know, while I could now do a lot more work with the torch without needing to stop and go get gas, when it came time to load them in the truck to go somewhere, ooh, those things are heavy. Um, this time for me in the studio, I made a lot of interesting things. This is a very simple stand, um, just black pipe, but these to the day, 20 plus years later still are in my shop and still get used all the time. Um, simple thing, very beneficial, easy to move, great infrastructure project. Whether you end up doing woodwork, metalwork, 
great thing. It goes across whatever you might do over time. Uh, I built some things that I regret. I built some great big steel things for doing great big steel work or woodwork that took a lot of time and energy. And then when I did have the reality of moving or that work changing for myself, I was tied into this very large, heavy infrastructure I had built. Um, I also built myself a welding table. And this is a drama that has stayed with me for years. Um, I love the table and what a large flat surface can do for you. But at the same time, logistically, nightmare. This thing weighs basically what a car does and doesn't have wheels and flexibility issues. Um, I moved to a studio that was what I thought was a dream studio. It was a live workspace down by the beach. Uh, it was wonderful. It was the first real significant time I tried to move this giant table and um, started to figure that maybe I had set myself up for some trouble down the road by building too much infrastructure. Um, my little stands still were a great use of time in making. I used them all the time for different things, very simple to use. Yeah, I built some other pieces. Again, I wanted to be able to heat up one of them and bend it and twist it. I think tomorrow we'll use your I figured out a way to make the device to do it. And I went through a creative process of making something and then building infrastructure, building tools, to make again, to build tools. And yes, I did do crazy projects with people at times. This is the Harley Davis Schwinn. It's a combination of a Harley Davidson trailing arm pedaled by a Schwinn front end. Um, but, you know, I, I do do whimsical things, but it came time to studio number eight. I had been renting studios. Um, putting electrical into studios that then I move on to another place and I really felt that one of the things that was missing was continuity of a space for me. So we see these surplus seafood containers all the time driving down the highway. We see them. They're stacked up in the ports. You know, we, we start to see them here and there being used. I decided that I was going to put my studio on and transport it. Okay. So the first thing I realized is that they come in standard dimensions. All right, the 20 is nice. I messed around with the 20, theoretically. 40 is nice. 40, the only problem with them is it's a standard height. Okay, this is a 45, and it becomes a high cube is what they call it. That's another cubic foot vertically inside. What's the advantage? Well, later on... When you go to do lighting inside of this space, you technically have a whole other foot up above your working space, your air space, that you can do mechanicals in. You can run your air, you can run your lights, you can run whatever. So I like this high cube. I like that extra space. You say, well, but you have that great big table. How are you going to get that big old table in there? You say, well, you know, I moved it every which way for years. At one time, I built these transitional mounting plates that you see on it to get the giant casters onto the bottom. I used automotive trailers and numbers of friends to drag it. There's a friend here who actually moved the table a few times. Thank you, Darius. Big applause. Um, so, you know, finally in the end, when I went to do it, I decided that it's got to be done with one of these tilt trailer beds. You can actually hire these people, these independent tow truck guys, to come by your shop for almost nothing. Um, just, you know, you get them to swing by, they drag the thing up on there. That truck actually has, let's see, so then that truck actually has 18 inches of hydraulic lift in the back, up and down. So it's not a problem getting it up, whatever, lined up to the container, tilt it right back up in, boom. Easiest thing ever done was getting the table in there. Um, all right, so then you truck it wherever you want to go, right? Um, there's a big problem if you go to take them off, then you need a crane, the weight shifts, all these kinds of things, okay? I thought about it, and I did a bunch of research. The chassis, okay, the adjustable chassis that the box sits on that registers, it goes down the road, is very inexpensive for the amount of material you're getting. 
you're getting a beautiful bridge structure, twin, you know, very nice steel structure. Whatever the axles are, if you wanted to, you could sell them out for scrap. At any rate, you're doing a great buy on that adjustable chassis. So I committed to the high cube container, and I was going to leave it on the chassis, just making an investment in the raw material. Um, and loaded it up, shipped it out. Okay. The one thing you see here, I have to also highly recommend. You can get pallet racks dirt cheap. Okay. Again, on a materials cost, the horizontal rail on a paddle rack used is maybe fifteen dollars. It's it's a structural steel component. You know, they're discarded now. You get them salvage. Okay. So I got some pallet racks that I found invaluable. First of all, to load the container to move stuff. This was early when I got it there, and I'm using it as a wood rack up front. Um, I hadn't really gotten into what was inside of the container initially. I don't know why it's not changing. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I did use even the container inside storing it, getting stuff to the pallet racks to then pull it back out later. Um, currently, I'm using it to finally access the top of the container in conjunction with my six foot and eight foot ladder that I've had for years. I just now take them and put them to the intermediate landing with a couple of pallets. I'm over. I'm up on top of the container. I'm now, you know, even higher. Everything's great. I don't have my wood stored there, but okay. Sacrifices. And that's what I'm saying is flexibility, building infrastructure for yourself so that you can, when your work changes, when you don't need the wood anymore but you want to get up on top, you can move around what you have. Um, the other thing that I've done, which I really like, are these regular pipe flanges. And you can put the pipe flange wherever you want on the container on the outside, and then immediately through a traditional pipe scaffold system, again, you can get these parts salvaged, a few dollars a piece, maybe $10 a piece for this bracketry. And you're running pipes, and then you can start to build any kind of lean-to type structure, awning structure off the sides of the container, and you still have your flexibility of moving at any time. You can drop the scaffolding off of it, unscrew the pipes, and it's all mobile. Okay? Um, why would you keep it up on the chassis? The thing is waterproof, right? But I've had a lot of studios that have gone awful wet. And even though I built things up on wheels in my studio and it flooded through there and the you know, chop saw still worked, all those good things, I don't know what happens if it gets really wet. You know what I thought? So I was like when I was weighing out these pros and cons of yeah, you put it up in the air means you gotta get everything up inside of there, but then I kept going back to myself and saying, Yeah, but just just think of it, you're up in the air, that gives you one more little cushion, you're mobile at any moment, whatever. So as you see, a hundred year flood happened while I was there initially, and you know, it got wet on the outside, it didn't even get to the container. You know, it topped off there at the wheels and people lost homes, Red Cross came in, everything, and my little container popped right open, all ready to go, what do you want me to weld or fix for you, sir, you know? So moving along those lines, what what do you do for you know getting power into it? These kinds of things. I just went super simple. Okay, all I wanted was 100 amps. Give me 100 amps. Give me a little bit of 220 to run my welder. Yeah, I'd like my compressor to go and the plasma at the same time. Maybe if I don't, I promise not to turn on this over here. I'm a good boy. You know, I just sort of thought I can get away with my shop after all these years. 100 amps, and I'm going to break it up a little bit of 220, a little bit of 110. And I'm just going to go from there and see what happens, you know. And I just isolated the little sub panel. I can move it in the container if I decide, you know what, I need more power. I need to do this. I'd rather have it there. So again, it's that infrastructure, but staying flexible. Again, you know, over the years I've learned, wow, I like to be able to have multiple air hoses running. You know, I like to be able to have my 220 plug in right next to my 110, but then at the same time, you know, I want to have a couple of plugs because maybe one of them is this little radio project, this little soldering job I'm doing, but then I need to grind in a minute. So, you know, I want some flexibility in my workspace. Um, 
So on one side, I considered it kind of my heavy usage, and that's the one we just saw. And then on the other side of my shop, I have sort of the lighter usage. You know, this side, mainly I'm just going to test things. It's more of a workbench application, you know. But again, it's flexible because I'm not sure do I want it there in my shop indefinitely. I don't know. So there are some things that come with the container, even if you're not a welder, per se, or planning out your shop. They throw in these hard points for you. You know, hey, here's a hard point that you can attach a car to. Wow, it's that strong engineered into this space? That's exciting. Because now in interior space, I have an extra foot in there, and I have hard points, you know? And I don't have to weld anything yet. So it's still a pretty good deal, you know? And again, towards some of the infrastructure over the years, I always did a little job. Oh, I got to drag more air hose? You mean I need another 25 feet of air hose? I need a, well, you know what? It's wonderful. You can take it, you put a three way connector in there, you run 125 foot that way, you drop 125, you take 125 over the roof of the container to the other side. And you've just done all your air infrastructure to do your, you know, and it's all flexible. You know, in this case, I'm just using cord, you know, and I just tied off air lines, and then I adjusted it back a harder point because I decided, nah, it's more, you know. So, um, and, you know, the switching, I'm, I have a background in theatrical lighting and stuff. So you would want to label just a cord running in the dark somewhere because you've got to figure out what's not lighting up there and why do I need a switch and all of that, and, you know? A, a cube tap's a wonderful thing, you know? If you guys don't carry around, uh, if you take one thing from tonight, let me make sure I get this point, get a cube tap and get a three to two prong converter, all right? And whatever bag you roll out in always with your backpack, with your backpack, you should have a, a three-prong converter, three to two, and a cube tap. How many times? You can always find a cord. You can always jump in somewhere, but you know what? It's a simple thing. You just carry it. I love them. I do things where I'll just run an extension cord. You know, somebody says to me, hey, this old extension cord, I'm about to throw it out. Well, is it the male end? Is it the female end? Can I make two extension cords out of it? Can I make three? And all of a sudden... I have on my floor, yeah, I have a spider, but I know that this spider just goes to these three grinders sitting on this table, you know, and I don't have all this mess. I can get to them at any time. Okay, some of you are saying, well, I know how to weld, so I'm going to weld to my container. Beautiful. Just make sure you get them ventilated. You know, that paint's toxic, whatever, but it's going to be an issue for you in the container anyway is ventilation. So why not start by putting a fan in, you know? Okay. Um, they're all easy steps. Over the years, I like to have my tools organized. So I built a lot of steel ways to hold my tools and keep them organized, and I always dreamed of this double-decker shop, you know, and I even had two-story shops. But what I found is over time, efficiency in the space. You know, people have said to me, oh, you work like a chef or you work like a doctor or something. Yeah, but I was also trained as a blacksmith, and a blacksmith, you only have so long to get this hot thing from here to there to be effective on it. So, you know, efficiency of space is a big deal. Yeah, I have little racks that are similar to a chef or a doctor's thing. These are the tools I want to access next to that tool when I go to work on it. I don't want to have to go all the way over to my toolbox to get that little scraper that I always use right next to this thing. So I also make, this is a beautiful one, by the way. All you makers, take for a minute. What do you always do? You need to raise that thing up just a half an inch. No, maybe a three quarters of an inch. I'm not quite sure. Uh, if I just had a little block of, say, three quarter inch plywood, if I had some three eighths plywood right now, if I just had a quarter inch piece of, you know, these boxes, since I made them, all it is is this is the increments. It's quarter, well, it's eighth and squiggle now. And then it's quarter, three eighths, half, three quarters, one by material. And whenever I have a scrap that's whatever that is not for sure and I want to keep it and stuff, I just throw in that little box. And then when I need to jump something half inch, three quarters of an inch, I go straight to that box. I can pull that box out. I can put it on the table. I can put it away. I can take it over to my wood area and pick the scraps I think that I'm going to use again. And then every time I know that's three quarter inch material. Um, I do stupid things too. 
measuring tapes. Where's my square? Where's my measuring tape? If I had, if I knew where my razor blades were, my measuring tape, and my square, how much faster and efficiently would I work? Okay. So why not just make a thing that glorifies and keeps all your possessions right there together? You know. Okay, it's spooky, it's me, but you know that's that's what it does. Um, so then we get into the, how do you build a shop with all these crazy little things and concepts? Well, this is my double decker shop right here, okay? And I can switch this from doing electronic soldering, hacking, assembly, crazy contraption, whatever, to metal fabrication, grinding, and everything, no problem. And this is only in about 10 feet, 12 feet, okay, is what we're looking at here. And like you can see, with the old, you know, step stool thing, I can go easily just one, two, three steps up onto, and then I'm at that table height of that steel table, and then I can walk across the steel table, and all of my Kennedy box and everything is right there at eye level. I can get whatever it was the tool was that I wanted to get on the second story, and then I can just step right back down on and be at workbench level and on the floor. You know, there's also raw materials up there. That's where the abrasives are for that area, actually. It's all up there in these little boxes. I love boxes. You know, I make boxes like crazy. It's practice, you know, and it organizes things for you. It gives you potential to work on a project and get on to the next project. Um, this is the other side, and again, it's a double-decker kind of a concept for me. The, the tools that I rarely get to are up high, and I keep my work surfaces clean so I actually can step up on something and find myself at a second story within this limited space. The other thing that I'm kind of skipping in some ways is lighting, and I want to mention this. Thank you, Hydroponics Industries. Hydroponics has given us a thousand watts of the most beautifully color balanced interior lighting, ventilated, cooled, and lasts forever. And it's beautiful to work in. And from a person who's worked in shops their entire life and works every day in a miserable shop with fluorescent and all this kind of stuff, you can get used grow lights from people and you can buy really nice color balanced bulbs and you can run fans on them, and not only can you vent the whole space to the outside in a traditional whirly gig way, you can run a thousand watts of light, so there is no shadowing over workbench. It's not like this where I'm seeing four shadows hitting my workbench. You could probably get away with 600 watts, to be honest with you. You know, depends. A thousand watts is beautiful. It lights it up, and it's you could live in that container. So thank you, Hydroponics Industries, for figuring out the lighting for these things. So yeah, this is sort of my, now we're looking back on this sort of 10 feet of hard fabrication, construction, making. Um, you know, I come this way with metal fabrication and the giant table. There may be a picture. That way is all tools, little bits, blocks, all of that. Um, I mentioned some of the making to make. Um, this is this is my little workbench as it normally sits, okay? And again, I love these little, you know, the air things. It's just it's a cube tap for the air, you know? So what I do is I run three die grinders all the time. I've got one with a burr, one with a little wire thing, and one with an abrasive, okay? I just leave them set up. I don't change, oh, wait a minute, let me get that little burr, and let me get the wrenches, and let me... I just leave those three... They're plugged into that three-plex, it plugs into an air hose, and so then I use it all the time that way. What do I do? I love little C-clamps that I find at garage sales that are old and bad, don't work right. A C-clamp that's already screwed up, you kind of put it on the table, tighten it up just enough, and then you make a little holder, and all of a sudden you have, you, I don't know if you can tell, but the little die grinder's just set in a little rest, you know? And the same thing with all the plasma is that's an old C-clamp, a little bit of quarter-inch rod, bend it up, boom, all of a sudden I have access to plasma or welder one, two, right there. So as I'm working in my limited space, yeah, we're in a container, it's limited space, what are you saying? Yeah, but from here I can access plasma cutter, welder, and three different die grinders. And I don't have to stop to change the tool bit. I don't have to stop to change what's plugged in, where the air is going, any of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's an efficiency in the space. Again, I do these little stands that I make this stuff. You know, I don't know why. It just 
when I do a project and the grinder falls off the table once, I say, next time we're doing this project and that project, I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to make a little thing to hold the grinder so it doesn't fall off the project table every time. And I think it's what we all forget is that we, we get inspired to make the next great thing and i got to fire something else out because nobody else is here. The next great thing is, right, I wanted to pull a rabbit out of a hat, okay? It, but I went to all the trouble to develop the thing and to make it and to come up with how I'm going to package it. Boom, 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 and you go, well, what else? You know, you can't just do a rabbit out of a hat, but anybody ever seen a rubber duck fly? No? All right, let's try a rubber duck fly. And you guys ready? All right, we're going to go three, two, one. Yay! Rubber duck flying. Okay. So, you know, even so, I think to myself, yeah, I build these little stands for the grinders to do this and that. Well, this contraption that I brought with me here today, what does it do? I don't know. I don't exactly know, but something imagination is good. You know, something's going on in there. I'm thinking about it. What can I do with it? Well, it was made just to pop a rabbit out of a hat. That's really all it was for. Well then, well, I mean, just a minute, what we did was we changed one little thing, right, and then we just shot a hippopotamus up into the air, or, you know, we shot a, oh, hippopotamus, that's a good one. I didn't say a hippopotamus, I did a rubber duck, right? All right. So at any rate, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, sometimes you have to build these things and take the time, even though it's, we're thinking of one thing, it may lead to something else along the way, and then you go one day, you go, oh, you know what? I do want to make a hippo fly, too. Three, two, one. Whoa! The hippo didn't go as far. So, um, yeah, I make these little things in between projects, and I try to learn from one to the next of what, how many times did the grinder fall off the table before I figured out a way to not have it fall off the table. Um, I also like the space directly under the table. And I mean, I, this gets ignored all the time. We see it even here, right? What's going on right here? It's the easiest space for me to access in the world as I'm working on this surface. You never see it, right? How many of you at your workshop have anything right here? I mean, I am in one place on my table. I don't have a picture of it here. My hacksaw is right here. My vice is right here. Where do I need the hacksaw? Every time I walk up to the vice to hacksaw something, well, actually, just right there. You know, and it can be on the side of the table. It's not taking away from my work surface, and it's staying right there. Um, I've found over time that it can be flexible space, and I just have little tubes. Right now, I might have a pair of pliers, and their next mic, it might be a file. You know, but it's a simple way to keep things right there. It's space we forget. I did have an issue of I want to be able to get heavy things up and down from the container, simple without being a big deal. So. Um, I just put in the regular 12 volt winch and uh, was able to. I can winch stuff in and out of it with a 12 volt system, no problem. I'm getting close on time, but I'm going to try to wrap it up here. Uh, another one that's a great build that I would say for people similar to the block cabinet. This is your standard screw sizes of drywall screws as we use them today, and your standard SAE stuff as you go through. One of those is quarter 20. You know, and it goes through them, half 13. And whenever you're on that project, whenever you need a quarter, it's my dad, I grew up with a wish jar, and it was screws, it was nails, it was everything. This is the same thing, but you know what those little boxes, you always know where one-inch drywall screws are. And when you get done with them, you put them right back there. And if you need a little bit longer one, it's the next box over. Um, very simple one boxes again, and I think I'm out of time, but i got to do one more magic trick. Come on. I think that's it. Okay, so that, yeah, I'm done. Woo! And I think that's time, isn't it? We're done? Thank you. <laughs> I can keep going if you guys want. We'll fire off like one more thing. i got to do a parachute man for you guys, because that was the other one. I wanted to be able to do a rabbit out of a hat, just because rabbit out of a hat seemed like a good one. But then also, as a boy growing up, there was always these little parachute men. And I would try throwing them as hard as I could, and I tried unwinding them, and I tried everything. And I was never really able to get a parachute man up very well. And what I've found since I've got this contraption is, and it probably works now that I think about it, you know, if I just did it manually this way without my contraption, but 
Okay, you gotta open up the parachute guy. I think probably a lot of parachute guys go to their doom because nobody opens up the parachute once. Yeah, so you open up the parachute. You yeah, put the little man. You gotta kinda put him inside. And then we put him in there. All right, parachute guy, here we go. Let's big finish, grand finale, everybody. Here we go, three, two, one. Oh, no! <laughs> well, so much for the big Thank you, everybody, again.